still relatively um, new intellectually, I guess. Uh, it's been a project that I have been working on with my colleague Chris Weibel at the School of Public Affairs at CU Denver, uh, and so many of our students, and now Hong Tao Yi, and a colleague of ours in the School of Environment and Natural Resources here at OSU, Ramiro Berardo. So we've, we've expanded our team. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background on this. Let me, uh, is this not working now? Of course, no, it was working. working. It was working. Five seconds ago. Working seconds ago. Did I, did I mess something up? I don't know. Let's, I can always use I use my fingers there. <laughs> I'm capable though. <laughs> Let me give you a little background first of all. So uh, I've been at uh, the School of Public Affairs at CU Denver since 2009. Um, when I got there, my friend Chris Weibel here, right there, this is me, this is Chris. Uh, we, we got together and, and realized we had a lot of overlapping research interests and uh, decided you know, we should, we should really like get some students to kind of engage with us a little more actively in, in thinking about some of the, the big questions around public policy and, and public administration and, and the, the processes of how we uh, engage in public policy. And in particular, Chris and I have both been really interested in issues related to both collaboration and conflict and how people engage in different ways in, in influencing public policy um, in policy subsystems and in policy decision-making venues, but we came at it from slightly different traditions. So we, we created the, what we know as the WAPR, Workshop on Policy Process Research, started doing some work together. And around 2012, we got a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to start looking at the conflicts that were brewing in the U.S. around fracking. And that led us to, well, we, had, we knew nothing about oil and gas development at the time. Uh, I was mostly working on water issues. Uh, but that led us to really start engaging more with um, people who are trying to influence policy processes in Colorado around fracking. And so we were doing interviews and some survey work uh, with governments, nonprofits, uh, industry people. And we started <coughs> bringing together a task force of these people in the state of Colorado to ask them, you know, is our research useful for you? We're trying to understand how people are engaging with in coalitions, what they're fighting about. And we had one person in the room raise their hand at one point and say, you know, is this debate over fracking typical? Is it, is it worse or better than conflicts around other policy issues? And we kind of looked at each other and said, I don't know, <laughs> is it? So as we were trying to figure that out, we realized we needed to really be able to measure conflict in a direct and theoretically meaningful way. Ah, I'm gonna try that one. Okay, so we started publishing, we started doing more outreach, we started working on this idea of policy conflicts, how are we gonna measure it? And as we were playing with this, we started building this framework. We started out with calling it a theory, and one of our PhD students made us a tote bag that was the policy conflict theory. It was our first iteration of conference paper, and they were like, it's not a theory, it's a framework, whatever. We, I don't know, so we put out X on our tote bag. We got more funding, National Science Foundation funding. We got Hong Tao pulled in. This is Ramiro Gerardo from Natural Resources, or Environment and Natural Resources. And we started, publishing. So I'm going to talk to you today about this framework, a little bit what it is, and some, give you uh, some examples of how we've been measuring it in the context of debates around oil and gas development that uses hydraulic fracturing. So why did we need this framework? Uh, one of the things we argued is that, you know, all policy decisions have the potential to involve conflicts of varying degrees of intensity. It's part of a democratic form of decision making. Uh, yet, we had this kind of definitional and theoretical vacuum around this concept, at least in the policy process literature. Certainly, people in political science, sociology, international relations have studied conflict um, in a lot of different ways, and we started diving into a lot of that literature to inform 
uh, how we were thinking about this concept and what it means. So, um, you know, a lot of the policy literature has kind of assumed conflict exists or measured it indirectly through behaviors like political mobil mobilization or sometimes if we just have competing values. So there's ways of measuring it that we've seen, but we wanted to get more precise. So we said, well, this is actually messier than just this concept. Conflicts are affected by things and they also affect things in the policy system. So this framework is kind of, this is kind of the, the big picture, high level view of our framework. Uh, I'm gonna dive into each of these pieces of it here in a minute. So it includes a policy setting, which has policy actors, different levels of action, events, different policy issues um, that relate to what we're calling an episode of policy conflict. that has both cognitive characteristics of the people that are involved and behavioral characteristics. And then those episodes of policy conflict can have outputs and outcomes that influence the policy setting. And of course, the policy setting can also influence those other outcomes. We have some assumptions in our little framework. We assume that these conflicts can exist at different levels. So you can have a broad political system. You know, right now, at kind of a national level of politics, we, we pretty much see a very uh, divided uh, political system in the US right now where people are very um, intensely debating certain issues. Um, but we also have policy subsystems where a group of actors maybe in a particular geographic region, say around hydraulic fracturing or oil and gas development, kind of debating over you know, how and whether we should drill for oil and gas. Um, but you can also have these policy action situations where you make a policy decision in a particular venue, for example, um, in a legislature or in a regulatory arena. And all of these things can interact with one another. Uh, we also recognize that you know, this, a lot of uh, social psychology and uh, political psychology recognizes that you know, some of the fundamental features of human decision making can drive conflict. We have selective attention, we are emotional in how we process information. We tend to identify with our in-groups and demonize our out-groups. So we're, we're kind of programmed in certain ways to engage in conflict. Uh, but we also assume that conflicts are not necessarily bad or good. They can have good things. They can have bad things. So we want to understand them. We want to measure them. Um, so what are their characteristics? So we start with these kind of cognitive and behavioral characteristics, um, and we assume that an episode of policy conflict has to involve two or more kind of policy actors, uh, people who are engaged in this policy process, expressing these cognitive and behavioral characteristics. So what are these? Um, well, we have three kind of cognitive characteristics that we define, uh, and then some examples of behavioral characteristics. But the cognitive characteristics begin with this divergence in positions. So I take a different position than you on whether or not we should drill for oil and gas here in this room. We have divergence. But just because we have divergence doesn't mean that there's a conflict. Um, the other characteristic that we say is present often in the policy conflicts is some, some degree of threats, where I feel your position is somehow going to threaten me. Um, or cause some harm or negative consequence to me. And then where you have pretty in intense conflicts is where there's also unwillingness to compromise amongst us. So we recognize that these three characteristics often have to coincide when we are assessing policy conflicts. And these, of course, then are often manifest when these things are present in the behaviors or strategies people engage in to then try to win over the debate. So they might form coalitions, they may um, you know, engage in lobbying, uh, try to influence the media, those types of things that we typically see in kind of any policy conflict. Now, of course, those kind of episodes of conflict are going to be conditioned by the structure of the policy setting or the rules of the policy setting, the characteristics or the attributes of the actors involved how experienced they are, how educated they are, um, 
what kind of perceptions they have of the risks of a policy issue, sometimes events, and the nature of the policy issue. And then of course, as I mentioned, there's some feedback. Sometimes we engage in these debates, we fight about them, maybe we can come to agreement, maybe we can't. Uh, maybe that changes the political dynamics in a system. Uh, maybe people feel that information has been improved from this conflict. So there's a lot of different outputs and outcomes that we see uh, from these conflicts. So here are some kind of primary dynamics we see of policy conflicts. We think that the intensity of the kind of cognitive characteristics will correspond with the behavioral, that if people are perceiving conflicts kind of in their brains to be intense, they're gonna respond in kind with certain types of behaviors. Um, that there will be variation though in these conflict characteristics that's conditioned again by this policy setting. Um, the internal components of the policy setting will also interact. There's a lot of endogeneity in this model, so to speak. Um, and that episodes of policy conflicts are interdependent and they evolve over time. So they, we have these episodes, but they're going to change and be dynamic. Okay, so let's zoom in. Let's get a, an example going here. So one of, one of the things I'm gonna do here is zoom in just to one of the features of this policy setting, policy actors. I'm kind of controlling for the policy issue because I'm looking at oil and gas development when I zoom in here. So that's going to be constant. Um, and I'm gonna kind of keep constant the level of action. We're gonna look at a policy subsystem. State of Colorado, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute, um, around oil and gas development. And I'm not gonna look at events either. So just the policy actors, I'm gonna look at how they relate to these cognitive and behavioral characteristics, and then show you some um, data on the outcomes that we've seen from this issue. All right, so here's where the fun starts. Any questions so far? Any clarifying questions I can answer quickly? No? Okay. If anybody's confused, write, write your confusion down and I'll <laughs> come back to it. So uh, Chris and I have been studying, again, this issue of uh, oil and gas development uh, in, at the state level since around 2012, 2013. And we've studied this population of policy actors. These are people who are actively involved in or trying to influence policy debates. So not the general public. May, these might be people in NGOs, uh, industry, academics, government at all levels. Um, and for this presentation, I'm gonna focus on Colorado. And the data I'm going to show you today comes from surveys that we've done. Oh, yeah. So in your population, did you go to particular networks, or how do you know? Yeah, so this is a different, this, that's a great question. This is a difficult population to study because there's no phone book of yeah, yeah. policy actors. You don't have a list that right. you can just sample from. So what we do to identify this population is kind of a modified snowball sampling technique. And a lot of the research that's done like in, on advocacy coalitions, for example, uses very similar techniques where you start with um, often a subset of actors that you know are actively involved from um, recommendations from people who are in the know. So we start with the kind of policy elites, for lack of a better word, ask them, and then we start also combing through news media, government documents on you know, regulatory hearings, for example, uh, anybody who we can find is visible on online that has a web presence uh, that expresses some political position on the issue or demonstrates that they are involved in trying to influence the decision in some way. Uh, and it led us to, in 2015, we identified 453 people in Colorado this way. Uh, it took some time, it takes a couple months for a PhD student to do this. <laughs> um, and we had 213 respondents. Um, in 2017, we had 551 people we surveyed, and we had 186 respondents. So, uh, you know, the response rates, it's surveys are challenging to do now. Response rates, people are getting a little saturated, especially on this issue. Uh, we also did interviews. We've done uh, around 20, um, we started zooming in on specific kind of action situations like Boulder County, there was a debate there, and so we zoomed in on some specific um, 
policy actors in areas of the state. The study location, the subsystem, are you talking about the infrastructure? No, so when we talk about the subsystem, we're talking about the political oh. kind of system. Yeah. Okay. And so this is really the people in the state of Colorado who are interested in the, the state level uh, politics that are going on. And of course in Colorado, the state level and local level politics are kind of intertwined. Um, but that, that's the, that's These what we are the mean. people that are debating the issue, the issue. Yes, that's exactly. The These are the people who are debating the issue. Yeah. yeah. So let me uh, give you a little picture so you can get this in your mind. So Colorado, this, this is a map, it's a couple years old now, but this was uh, from 2016, a map of active wells in Colorado. There's also many, many abandoned wells and there's many other wells that are undergoing permitting processes. Um, these were active wells in Colorado, I wanna say roughly around 60,000 at the time. Um, and what you can see by the colors is that the density of these wells is um, highly concentrated here near our urban areas. That's Denver right there, that's Boulder. Um, Fort Collins is up there. So the, the largest concentration of wells is really happening right along the Front Range where lots of people live. <laughs> There's also out uh, in Western Colorado, Southern Colorado, significant amount of development going on, but more rural. And you can see from this picture, uh, where we have an active drilling operation, uh, people's homes, right there. Uh, so you can imagine people feeling a little concerned about this <laughs> issue. Um, so, this has you know, been rapidly increasing also in the last 10 years. We've continued to see increasing amounts of development, especially in the front range of Colorado, people getting very concerned about you know, health effects, about uh, air quality, about nuisances from trucks. When you're drilling and you're in, you know, in the initial stages of uh, drilling and fracking a well, you have a lot of truck traffic and you have pipes coming in and out to bring water and chemicals and disposal uh, processes. So it's a very in intensive um, industrial process. Noisy, dusty, dirty. Anybody here seen a fracking operation, a drilling operation? Are you familiar with oil and gas development? Yeah. Um, yeah, imagine that right behind your house. <laughs> so what we try to do in our um, interviews and surveys is try to directly measure, you know, what was going on in people's minds in 2015 and 2017 in terms of those kind of three components of the cognitive characteristics. So what was their position on the issue and how divergent were people in this subsystem on their positions? Were there threats? And were they willing to compromise? Uh, we also measured their behavioral characteristics. What activities are they engaging in? So I'll start with that and just kind of show you just a quick, um, quick summary here of some of the comments we had from interviews when we asked about these things. Um, you know, people, if, the, if you assume that the kind of de facto policy decision in the state is that yes, oil and gas development, the state has decided it will occur. <laughs> we cannot allow bans to happen in the state because our state constitution has a preemption clause that says no communities cannot at the local level ban oil and gas development. And that's been um, a source of contention that people feel very um, divergent from that kind of state level policy. <coughs> so you'll see comments like, you know, large scale oil and gas development does not belong in the middle of the neighborhood. The state isn't protecting them, for example. Of course, you see other comments from the industry. The industry will say, we're, we're <coughs> responsible actors, we're, you know, doing everything we can, we are complying with regulation. The state will say, we are engaging in regulatory reforms. We are making, you know, good decisions on, on how to do this in a responsible way as well. Um, but people feel threatened by their opponents on this issue. So it's not just a debate on the issue. It almost goes to a personal level at a certain point. They're definitely the enemy. <laughs> um, 
And when you ask about compromise, there's no compromising when one side has all the power and money and the other side has nothing. Uh, I think that industry has, by and large, so, shown no interest in any compromise. So there seems to be these competing perceptions. So yeah. the, the example you showed right near a neighborhood, mm -hmm. was that something that moved in once development was already there, or is there a chance development Good question. crept out and yeah. then they just stopped right there? Good question. So it's a little bit of both. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of oil and gas development that's come in since, since housing, yeah. but we're also seeing housing development emerging into areas that historically had um, conventional drilling in them. And so, and then we're also seeing new drilling occurring where there was historically con conventional drilling. So it's a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah, it's actually a little bit of both. Um, on the behavioral side, then we also see people saying, yeah, we're going out, we're working collaborati collaboratively um, in some cases. Or other people saying, um, you know, no, we're, we're trying to get out into the media. We're um, doing whatever we can to protect communities. Um, other, person, other people saying, I'm just trying to inform people. I'm just, so there's lots of different ways these you know, policy actors are engaging. Sometimes collaboratively, sometimes more in a um, you know, antagonistic way, and sometimes more just rallying their base. So those are just kind of samples from the interviews to kind of get you in the mindset of how some of, the, some of these people are thinking about this. So from the surveys, though, one of the things that we were curious about is, well, how then do these policy actors and their attributes relate to these kind of conflict characteristics? So what I'm going to show you is a little bit of data from our survey that breaks out a couple different types of attributes of these policy actors. So we have kind of their deep core beliefs, which we measure as their, ideo their political ideology, how conservative or liberal are you. Um, we have some policy development knowledge we're interested in, their experience with oil and gas development, their risk and benefit perceptions. Um, how insular or um, diverse are their networks? Who do they talk to? Who do they engage with uh, on this issue? And then their organizational affiliation. So we broke out some of these characteristics of the actors, and then we sought to, we, we tried to figure out then how are they related to these conflict characteristics. Um, here's the survey questions we use to measure these cognitive characteristics, so divergent positions. We actually just asked them what their position was on oil and gas development on a scale of uh, one to five being, you know, stop to expand. And we took their position and we created a scale of how divergent they were from the mean policy position. We also asked directly about perceived threats. We asked a variety of questions, a battery of questions about their willingness to compromise on this issue. Would you be willing, if you're somebody who wants it stopped, would you be willing to see it expand under certain conditions uh, and vice versa? And then we had, we created an index of these. Uh, we also again asked about their behavioral characteristics. Uh, so over the past two years, have you engaged in any of the following? Uh, Things like providing information to the news media, coordinating with allies, sharing opinions, some of those examples that I showed you from the interviews, for example. Uh, one of the papers Chris and I had published from this looked at just how do those intrapersonal and interpersonal attributes relate to these, con just the cognitive characteristics of conflict that I mentioned. So again, policy positions, perceived threats, and willingness to compromise, and then we had some cognitive, um, so we had a cognitive scale. And we broke these out separately. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here. This, these were some ordered logit models. Um, I can talk about the, the details of this later because I just wanna save time for some Q&A. Um, but basically you'll see, for example, that political ideology, which positive end of the scale is more conservative, negative end of the scale is more liberal, um, was related to unwillingness to compromise, but not to taking extreme positions or perceived threats. Um, what was more important was insular networks. The more insular you are, the more, the higher, for example, you are on taking an extreme policy position. 
or perceptions of threats or unwillingness to compromise. For the political ideology, did you try looking at people on the far right and the far left end of the spectrum separately? Um, did we break that out? That, not as a continuous variable, because yeah, it's like the unwillingness to compromise would be people on either extreme. That's, that's a good question. We might, I don't think we did. Huh. Yeah, but that would be good to do. Yeah, and I'll show you just, we also then looked at those same variables um, with the cognitive and the behavioral characteristics. So we took the index from the cognitive, those three indicators, and then we have a, a behavioral index. And the political ideology, so the more liberal you are, the higher you are on the, the cognitive index. Um, so kind of higher your cognitive perceptions of conflict are in this subsystem. Um, the more experience, or sorry, the lower, yeah, no, the higher, the more liberal you are, the lower. So this is the, or, yeah, these are the odds ratios. Yes, more conservative you are, yeah, it's the opposite. I said that the wrong way. Um, ex but the more experience you have, the more likely you are to engage in the behavioral characteristics. That makes sense, right? Um, we played around with this combined cognitive and behavioral index, too, just because like, theoretically these sound like they fit together. Um, risk benefit perception rigidity, insular networks, um, organizational affiliation matters, but in different ways. And one of the interesting things we found, though, too, is that we included in these two, these are each separate models, these three columns here, right? So in the cognitive model, we found that the behavioral index is positively related to the cognitive. But the cognitive wasn't significantly related to the behavioral, which is interesting. Um, so what does that kind of mean? Well, just to kind of summarize some of those findings, one of the things that we think is interesting is, you know, these things, these attributes of policy actors matter, but in slightly different ways and to varying degrees. So rigid risk and benefit perceptions uh, relates to cognitive characteristics, but experience is more important for the behavioral characteristics. Um, you know, insular networks and uh, organizational affiliation seems to be important in both, but it's, it's nuanced. There's no kind of simple. What's yeah. the variation? You had one of your uh, variables mm -hmm. indicated personal, attracted personal, and attracted in professional sense. Was there variation there? Oh, no, we did break that out. Um, yeah, so we asked that, that threat question of, does this threaten you personally, and to what extent do you, does it threaten the state of Colorado? Yeah. We, that actually, there was very little difference in those two questions. They were tightly correlated, so we actually combined those into a into a threat indicator, but when we broke those out, we didn't see any significant differences there. We also, I mean, one of the things that we're curious about too, we, and initially we thought, well, your cognitive kind of drives your behavior. But maybe it doesn't. You know, in these kind of conflict situations, you can imagine as you're engaging in certain behaviors, your behavior also informs your perception of the world, right? So what you're doing then will shape how how conflictual you see this world to be, which I think is important um, just in terms of how we're theorizing and understanding this issue of conflict. Um, I want to show you just a little bit too on the outcomes. So I, I, I didn't spend a lot on those models just because again, I'm happy to answer questions and I don't want to, I don't want to go more than 40 minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to rush through a couple of this. So we met, we'd also measured these outcomes, like what, what's happening here? from this conflict. And some of the things we hear from interviews are things like, um, you know, hey, actually there's better information. Address rather than just coordinates that the, the COGCC is the state regulator. So you can find wells, for example, or permits. You know, what's happening in the state. So now the state's gotten better in providing information. Um, this is the State Department of Public Health and Environment. They have on-site evaluation, even though it's not regulatorily required. Um, the county is better educated. Um, people have gained strength in their political capacity. They can mobilize people better. Uh, other people feel that, oh, back to these events, which we didn't measure in the survey, but things like we had an explosion uh, from a, an abandoned flow line from an old conventional well, so not a fracked well, 
that killed two people and destroyed a home a couple years ago. And these types of things, people have said, they'll have a significant impact. People are going to be fired up. Um, public awareness has grown. People are more educated about this issue. They understand it. So we also then asked on the survey about some of these things. And we asked just a simple question, have this battery of issues, and the issues are down here, gotten better or worse over the last two years? So we asked this in 2015 and then in 2017. <coughs> 2015 is in the kind of grayish color here, 2017 is in the yellow. And these first few, so protecting public health, economic benefits, government regulations, um, governmental, environmental impacts. On, these are the average, these are just the means, okay? So on average, these things look like they've gotten better, although there's some differences between 2015 and 2017. Uh, protecting vulnerable populations, government relations, political debate, media coverage, worse. Science and technical information, lots better. So, interesting to me that the information's gotten better and the political debate's gotten worse. Because I'll, I'll just reinforce this right now for anybody who says all they need is more information <laughs> and everything will be fine. <laughs> information is not necessarily something that will solve a political debate. Um, probably seen that with climate change the last few years. Doesn't necessarily make it better. Um, of course, we might then ask, well, how do these characteristics of those actors, again, relate to some of these um, outcomes? And then do the, these cognitive and behavioral characteristics of the conflict also relate to these outcomes? Again, this is all perceptual information from surveys, so I don't want to draw some strong causal conclusions here. And I recognize there's just built-in endogeneity into these um, relationships, so I'm emphasizing these are relationships. So. Uh, we haven't delved into this data very deeply at all, so I'm just going to show you some correlations here um, for the sake of spurring perhaps some questions. Um, so political ideology, if, if we take the average of the health and environmental impacts from those, that battery of questions I asked, political ideology, if you're more conservative, that's correlated with taking a you know, positive view of the health and, and environmental impacts, which makes sense. Uh, if you have more experience, you have more positive view. Um, education, not really significantly related to these, except 2017, like a s small significant correlation with the political debate, um, getting better. Risk and benefit perceptions, if, you're, if your risk exceeds your benefit perceptions of oil and gas development, you're obviously less likely to think that health and environmental impacts have gotten better. Uh, if you have insular interactions, you're less likely to think these things have gotten better. And then your you know, cognitive kind of conflict characteristics are also negatively associated with these perceptions of impacts. Um, the political debate, scientific, scientific and technical information, we don't see a lot of significant correlations there. But let me just show you this when you break it out by organizational affiliation. So, 2015, 2017, 2015, 2017, 2015, 2017. So here's organizational affiliations. Green is environmental and citizen groups. Blue is local government. Yellow is state government. Green is industry. And this dark, darker blue is other. So average uh, impacts of health, economy, environmental regulations. If you're in an environmental organization, you take a very different perception on these issues than somebody from industry or government. Now, if you ask about the political debate, everybody's pretty much in agreement that it's gotten worse. And if you ask about science and technical information, everybody's pretty much in agreement that it's gotten better. So, very interesting in the, and of course, differences across over time. We're seeing kind of a dampening effect um, of those perceptions of have things gotten better in 2017? And I can talk about that later if people have questions. So let me wrap up with a few kind of summaries and next steps so we can have some conversation. What we're arguing is that this policy conflict framework is 
it's a tool. It, it gives us a conceptual approach for helping us measure and evaluate the sources, characteristics, and effects of policy conflicts. And as we're you know, starting to dig into some of our data, we're finding that these policy actor attributes, you know, your affiliations, your networks, your experience, sometimes your ideology, um, shape how you perceive conflicts and how maybe you engage in conflicts and how you perceive the outcomes. But we need to test this framework, obviously. It's new and we're still playing with the data and trying to figure this all out. So we need to test it at different levels. Again, we were working across this kind of state level subsystem and not really diving into a lot of specific policy decisions, which now we're going to do. So with the help of Hong Tao and Ramiro Barardo, we have a National Science Foundation grant to look at policy decisions across 15 US states and test some aspects of this framework out at a very more micro level, but also across more states. Um, Chris and I also have a new grant looking at oil, or not oil and gas development, but siting of wind, solar, pipelines, and transmission lines, and doing some similar work on those energy sources. So just as a little preview, and you can make Hong Tao come back and present this, you know, in <laughs> six months when we have <laughs> more data. Um, we're collecting a lot of uh, data on specific policy decisions at, that were made at the state level, but we're, you know, we don't know exactly. Our population's much bigger than 300 now. We're collecting legislative and regulatory decisions. We're doing media coding. We're coding the actual policy decisions themselves to identify the design components of these policies. And we're gonna be interviewing and doing um, a survey of policy actors to try to figure out kind of what their perceptions of the, the conflict around specific policy decisions were versus just the broader issue of oil and gas development. Um, this was a paper that Hong Tao was the lead author on that he presented at APAM this, this year. So we've collected some of the um, newspaper data and Hong Tao dug in and looked at um, the Ohio news articles from 2006 to 2018 or 2017, did we go through 2017 or 2018? 2017. 2017, so 10 years of news media um, coverage on oil and gas development in Ohio and then in Colorado. And we have a dictionary of uh, conflict words and policy words and uh, concord words and we're looking at how they just relate and, and change over time. So this is um, just showing you some of the, the changes over time and in, in news media coverage and how conflict gets depicted in the news media and policy gets uh, depicted in the news media. And we're seeing some interesting trends, but we're gonna see how this plays out across 15 states and then also look to see how policy decisions then relate to these trends and patterns over time. So kind of taking a very different level of analysis than what we did, what Chris and I did with our surveys and our interviews in Colorado. We have hypotheses we're gonna test that we came up with cool names for, the perfect storm hypothesis, where we think so higher levels of kind of divergent interpersonal, interpersonal attributes of the actors will be associated with these high levels of conflict, um, choose your battles, higher perceived threat from a policy decision relative to other decisions, the more varied and frequent behavioral characteristics, um, skewed distribution, the distribution of policy conflict intensity for a population of decisions will have a skewed distribution. So we expect to see only some of those, com those policy decisions having high levels of conflict, a lot of them having very little conflict, some having a little, a moderate amount. So we want to really test that and see what this distribution is and then really dive into, you know, certain policy decisions may have very little conflict. What are those characteristics versus those that have high conflict? And so then we can tease out those policy issue characteristics in more detail. So that's it. More PCF coming soon. So I want to say first thanks to Chris, who's not here, my Whopper friend and um, funding that we've had and support from the School of Public Affairs. And thank you to Glenn College for having me. So any questions? Yes. Yes. Tanya, yes. the uh, public uh, or people are more informed now than they were two years ago, right? And mm -hmm. I assume 
mm -hmm. that they are also more informed than they were in 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. In the mid-1960s, in the northern part of the Netherlands, the enormous gas reserve was found. Uh -huh. They've been tapping it ever since, uh -huh. and the first serious earthquakes emerged mm -hmm. five to seven years ago. Mm -hmm. There's photographs in the news, at least back in the Netherlands, of houses with serious cracks through them. No one knew mm -hmm. what they were doing in the 60s, when right, they were right. emptying out this gas reserve, and right. it was one of the largest in the world. Yeah. So now fracking is different, it works with shales and everything mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. So is there any longer term information to the public at large? Now mm -hmm. this is not a methodological question, of course, mm -hmm. but any longer term information about what possible consequences of fracking are? Because I don't think we know that. Well, because, because the, the large, so the high volume hydraulic fracturing, hy Fracturing as a hydraulic fracturing as a technology has been around for quite a while, yeah, but yeah, yeah. but the use of it for high volume high volume hydraulic fracturing and and in combination with horizontal drilling has really only been going on for about ten years now, yeah, yeah. maybe a little longer. But it so the the health studies are still yeah. still ongoing and they're very difficult to do because you know getting population level data is takes many many years. Um, and it's also very correlational, and, and in places like the Front Range of Colorado, it's hard to tease out some of the specific impacts of fracking from other pollutants that are in that area, if you're looking at health effects, for example. Um, air quality emissions, there's some really good studies coming out that or actually have come out on air quality, um, and looking at how fugitive methane, for example, and other types of emissions um, ha leaking you know, from from the drilling operations and, and distribution of, of the oil and gas has caused some severe air quality issues. So that, that data is pretty good, but there's also some pretty simple things that um, producers can do to minimize that, and states have, like Colorado, have responded in changing regulations to, to improve that, um, but it, it's, it's slow. The information takes a while to gather. Um, We've gotten better information on, you know, the extent to which groundwater pollution is it or groundwater is at risk from fracking fluids. Um, but then there's, you know, all of the issues around regulatory compliance, which need to be studied better as well. Yeah. Do you have a measure or a, like a good proxy measure for the perception of power imbalance in this model? So like. A, I think that the, the local communities mm -hmm. flipped between 2015 and 17 on the mm -hmm. uh, perceptions of health and environmental impacts. So mm -hmm. they were a little bit, mm -hmm. okay, like in 15 they thought it was going to be a little bit okay, but then mm -hmm. by 17 they're like, actually this isn't okay. Yeah. And then obviously the environmental groups, uh -huh. they're like, is there anything of that looks at the extent to which like industry feels like, you know, they have the, and however you would operationalize power, but like yeah. they have the power that they need to sort of do what they want relative yeah. to these local places yeah. and environmental groups. Yeah, we, we didn't, we st that's a super question and a lot of um, community groups in particular that have tried, and tried to engage in this debate have um, mentioned to us that they do feel, you know, they're at a tremendous disadvantage in terms of financial resources, for example. Um, and it, it's interesting, you ask the same question perhaps of some of the industry association groups and they say, well, yeah, we may have money, but you know, we don't have the same kind of outreach and, and networks in the community that some of these other groups do. So power, you know, first you have to say what type of power, right? And, and then power varies in terms of political power by, well, who has your ear? You know, we have a different governor who just got elected and so somebody who may have had political power because they had you know, a direct line to the governor in the previous administration may not have that same power today, even if they have the same resources. So that power, the power can vary kind of depending on context. And so we haven't come up with a good way of measuring it here. Um, a lot of people are concerned about it. And a lot of people will say, you know, it's all about who has power. Who wins, who wins the political debate is often, you know, about power. Um, I can, yeah, <laughs> yeah, here. I can go more into that, but here and then stuff. Yes. Um, who owns the mineral rights, and does it change the sort of responses you get? The yeah, so mineral, mineral rights uh, ownership in uh, Colorado is, is separate from the surface ownership. So, 
sometimes you have the same, you can have the same owner, but it's generally different from surface ownership. Um, we don't, these respondents, may, we have a few mineral rights owners in this study. Well, actually, no, we have a few representatives of mineral rights organizations. So there are, there are organizations that kind of represent mineral, the, the rights and interests of mineral owners. So we don't interview individual, it's hard to find mineral, you know, individual mineral rights owners, but, um, so I haven't, it, that's such a small proportion of our survey population that I haven't looked at that in terms of whether or not that matters. But, yeah, it's, that, that's a compl whole complicated yeah. issue too. Because uh, there are some, there's also what's called forced pooling in Colorado and many other states. So if you're a mineral rights owner and, and you don't want to have to lease your, your mineral rights um, to an oil and gas operator, but everybody else around you has, or has leased their rights, they can force you into that lease agreement uh, because it would, you being a holdout would prevent them from accessing everybody else's mineral rights. So there's, there's actually a lawsuit now to try to force the state to reconsider that forced pooling question. So yes, this is a follow the power question. Do you, I mean, is there any way that you measure um, what do they believe that if they do actions will result in change? So oh, their there, there like efficacy here, yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Because like, yeah. that's a way to get at power a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just something about um, if you took these actions, how likely do you think it would be that something would change? You know, we actually, so that, you're like, I'm going back, I'm digging deep, like when we wrote our first survey, yeah. we started the, the first, we did a survey in 2013 too, that I didn't show you the results from here because we wound up changing the survey significantly when we decided we wanted to more directly measure conflict. But when we first started <coughs> measuring these activities, yeah. this issue came up, this issue of e efficacy. Yeah. And we asked, we asked a question that was, to what extent do you engage in these activities and are they effective? Oh, okay. So was this, we did yeah. this double barrel question. So which are not engaging in it. Well, so there was, yeah, yeah, so if, yeah. if you're not yeah. engaged, right. there, it was a zero. And yeah. if it's like only moderately effective, it was a one, yeah, somewhat effective yeah, yeah. was a two, yeah. and, and very yeah. effective was a three. And we've had some students play with that data. Huh. Um, but it might be more interesting to just say, first of all, yeah. do you believe that engaging in the, these activities which would create have change or whatever. Yeah. And that might explain why you've got a lot of zeros because they, they have low efficacy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That would be a good inner, like, yeah. you need to kind of follow up with that. Yeah. Some groups have yeah. a lot. Of yeah. Yeah. I like that. That's a, that's a good option. Yes, Catherine. Um, it's also related to the power imbalance question. Mm -hmm. So I know, like, right now, um, we're probably trying to get, like, policy actors legislators or uh, decision makers mm -hmm, in the industry mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be like being part of the study and try to explore more, right? So mm -hmm. when we're measuring their behavior, is it like does the cognitive characteristics and behavioral characteristics mm -hmm. that you define still apply or should we measure their behavior in terms of some other um, standards? Because um, if we're looking at Leg actual decision maker. Well, and we did have we did have some regulators, uh, legislators, in, and county commissioners, etc. In this study population, we kind of lumped them into the government category. So we we tested this out on them. I mean, their their behaviors are going to be different. You know, they're not they're they're not going to engage in lobbying if you're somebody who's going to be lobbied. But we had a, we have a kind of wide battery of questions on activities that might be relevant to different types of actors. So you have to kind of tailor the questions to the capacity of those actors to engage. And then, yeah, if it's not relevant for that actor, it's not relevant. Yeah. Hey. I have, I have two sort of unrelated questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First is kind of a broad question. How do you define when, a con when an episode conflict starts like there's a yeah. framework offer guidance on that. Great question. <laughs> the other question is, there was one result that was really interesting to me, uh, like insular interactions uh -huh. was 
positively correlated, and I can't remember what it was, but it was something like With the cognitive like, characteristics of conflict and... Well, that, yeah. like, the, like the idea that things are getting worse. Oh, like yeah. Those people yes. who had like really... Yes, 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 words. yeah. So I'm just wondering, what's, what, for you, what's the story there? Or, or yeah. What do you think is going on? Yeah. Question? So the story there, you had two questions. Now I forgot the first one, but like, so let, me, let me start with the story there. The story there is, I think, uh, we're finding that the insular interactions are, that there are more insular interactions amongst people who are anti-oil and gas development. On average, I mean, that's not, it's, it's not, you know, 100% correlation there, but we're, you do tend to find that your, your position on oil and gas development is correlated with that. If you're more moderate, like, okay, I'm willing to kind of, yeah, see it continue, but current rate, let's not expand. You tend to have more diverse interactions, but that also is often correlated with being in, you know, government position, for example. You kind of take a more neutral stance. So I think that's what's going on, that you're, you're we're getting these kind of interrelationships with people's positions, their organizational affiliations, and then that is kind of reinforcing some of their network behaviors. Um, but not always. I mean, you can also see some of those in insular networks amongst people, you know, in the pro oil and gas development that are also kind of more at the extreme end of the drill baby drill. <laughs> so, um, what was your first question? Oh, that was just wondering how you how you identify. Oh, when it begins. Oh, I was going to try to skip that question. <laughs> going to hide over here. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. We haven't figured that out yet. Um, that that boundary question of yeah, when when does it end? Maybe when you know. So I when I first started studying <coughs> conflicts before the oil and gas stuff, I, I did a study in 2005 to 2008 of water conflicts in the Western United States, and we weren't measuring it quite as precisely as we were measuring it here. We we had decided we had defined it as a conflict exists when two or more actors um, disagree on policy goals or a policy solution. So it was just kind of more of this disagreement and left it at that. Um, and then the way we bound it in time was to say, if, if they have come to agreement, either through negotiation or a new policy decision, um, if they either come to agreement and that, or a lawsuit was settled or there's some sort of settlement, then we said, it ended, um, but it could then pop up in a new way, right? So these things kind of feed into each other. So I think, you know, in the policy conflict space, we kind of roughly bound it around, you know, if, if there's been some settlement, if it's around a policy issue, then it ends. But as long as these kind of characteristics are in play, that we're seeing some kind of high level of these cognitive and behavioral characteristics going on, then that's how we're observing it. When they kind of die out, then maybe it goes away. Anybody help? Yeah. Well, I, I was going to have a follow up. Yeah, it sounds like most of the policies you're looking at are formal policies. So, like a formal policy in Colorado about fracking in a specific location. Well, that's what we will be with this new grant, like with Hong Tao. What we were looking at previously in the survey that I just presented, like most of these data, was really just about this policy subsystem of, you know, how are people thinking about. Kind of the broader issue of oil and gas development, you know, should it occur, and if so, how and whether, you know, or, or how it occurs. So that first cognitive question that asked, do you agree or disagree, or something with that policy, what was the word? Oh, so the wording of that was, um, well, we first asked a question of, you know, as of today, what is your position on oil and gas development? Should it be stopped, limited, continued at the current rate? Oil and rate? gas development, that's it, not fracking. Um, well, yeah. oil and gas development that uses hydraulic fracking, okay, which 95%, okay. like actually 99% of it right now is fracked. So it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's all of it. Oil and gas development that uses hydraulic fracturing, stopped, limited, continued, expanded, moderately expanded extensively, it's kind of five point scale. Gotcha. And that was, that we used to then assess how divergent people were from the mean kind of Got position it. in Colorado. So okay. it was really more about their kind of fundamental view of this as a big policy issue versus a specific policy decision. Gotcha. Uh, but now we're diving into the specifics. Yeah. Follow up with the, the temporal to the spatial. Yeah. 
So a lot of the applications you're looking at, there are some really spatially relevant stakeholders, mm -hmm. but there are other decisions made at the state level that don't have such a spatial that's right. type of school funding, marijuana legalization. Right, that's right. And mm -hmm. we thought about trying to apply this framework to, or do you think there would be any difference if you looked at issues or conflicts and issues like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, I mean, the way, yeah, I think there is a spatial component here where you can drill down into kind of the local level and like neighborhood level even, um, and you might find more variation, like it might be more intense in, you know, Boulder County than it is in Weld County, which is more conservative and, you know, right, you know, they're right neighboring each other. Um, and, but we, I mean, we've kind of bumped it up to the state level so far and haven't drilled into some of that more localized. And certainly if we looked at like marijuana policy, for example, in Colorado, um, we wouldn't be able to drill into, well, you can, there's some local issues around marijuana, but I think we could still play with it. Um, I think it kind of depends on how you define your subsystem. And there's, you know, you could have a local subsystem or you could have a state level subsystem and they, those two often interplay with one another. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we could make it work. Sure, why not? <laughs> if it's not generalizable to other you know, types of policy issues, then throw it out the window. Well, another way to think of Rob's question is like the externalities that are going to be generated for that person. So if, it's, if they're thinking that's true. That, oh, this is a locational, this is going to affect my property values, this they're going to feel more intense. Yard, so I'm going to say no. So it's almost like the proximity of that person to mm -hmm. a drilling site may affect yeah. their, and I don't know if you've looked at that. So the respondents like proximity to, whereas marijuana policy in theory maybe yeah. affects, there's the actualities are affecting everybody. You may have particular groups that are absorbing more or less of this. No, no, that's, that's very true. And I think that's one of the characteristics of the policy issue that we could, if we were to compare conflicts in policy yeah. arenas, you could get at that, you know, how, how directly do people feel externalities of the policy issue? Yeah. Um, you know, and certainly marijuana policy, there's a lot of, you know, pot shops now, sure. like, in my neighborhood, you know, maybe I'm more, I'm upset because there's a pot shop next to my kid's <laughs> high school or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably not as intense as if I had a drilling rig behind my house, but, um, yeah, no, that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a very good point. Um, but I think we could, you could measure that, right? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could get at that with, the, we do, actually, when we unpack, you have to look at the paper. When we unpack the characteristics of the policy issue, proximity of the issue, ah. um, the morality of the issue too is something that comes out of the literature. Like if somebody sees this as a, you know, fundamentally more like gun rights issues, right? I mean, um, yeah. So the, some of those characteristics should could be tested across policy domains. We're out of time. All right, thank you, Tanya. Yeah, thank you all.